All right, good morning, Rio Vista. All right, well, this morning, my name is Sam Caston smith I'm pastor of education here at Rio Vista, by the way. Uh, and this morning, we're continuing in our series on the life of Peter. And today, Peter gets a win. <laughs> this, this is a good week for Peter. But if you've been with us the last few weeks, and especially, we've seen Peter go through some hard things. We've seen Peter at the moment of Christ's greatest need, at the crucifixion, with Christ enduring all of the torments of his trial. Peter denies him three times and runs off and weeps bitterly. He sees the empty tomb. And last week, we walked through Christ restoring Peter with some really hard, hard hard-hitting, convicting questions, and they just devastated Peter. What is God doing here? He's emptying Peter out of all of the impulse to say, I've got this. I'm enough. I'm strong enough. That's not an accident. Because this week, we find out that when we come to the Lord empty and we say, I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. The Lord comes and fills us with His Spirit, which is more than strong enough. He will do greater things through Peter when Peter empties himself out to be filled by the Spirit than Peter could have ever done on his own. Today we talk about Pentecost. And one of the things we understand as we're going through the Gospels, as we look through what it is that Jesus is doing in the Gospels, And in the early church, he's going back to the beginning and all of the negative judgments that were heaped upon man from the very beginning, the Lord and his unbelievable kindness and goodness to us is peeling them back. So what do you see at his cross? You see Jesus taking on all the curses of the fall. Just real quick, what do you see there? In the beginning, Adam was cursed. He was ashamed of his nakedness. What do you see on the cross? Jesus saying, I'll take the shame of nakedness. In the beginning, Adam is cursed to suffer thorns. What do you see on the cross? Jesus takes our curse and makes it his crown. Adam is cursed to suffer death. Jesus says, no, mine. Adam is separated from relationship with God. And Jesus, even there, will cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me. Why does he do that? It's so you can be clothed. It's so that you forever have absolute security in your relationship with God. And so today, one of the things that's wild is Jesus in his ministry. You know what he says? It's, it's, it's humbling and it's kind of wild. He says, you, my church, will do even greater things than I did. You hear that? It almost sounds blasphemous, right? Except it's Jesus saying it, so we're okay. What do you mean we're going to do greater things? Well, one of those things is there's some things that are still left unfinished. One of the judgments that's laid upon the shoulders of mankind at the beginning and the, the early chapters of Genesis is another judgment that we know of is the Tower of Babel. It's the story. It's very important, and it lays the foundation for what we're going to be talking about today. So Nimrod, such a wonderful name, in Genesis 10, a man named Nimrod decides he's going to build a kingdom for himself, and he wants to build it at Babylon. The Hebrew word is Babel. It's the same name, Babylon, Babel. And so Nimrod comes along. He's like, I'm going to build a great city. I'm gonna, we're going to do this. It's going to be wonderful, right? And we read that story, and it's just one chapter. It's, it's Genesis 11, but listen to, what they, listen to what said. Now, the whole earth had one language. Hang on to that. It's going to be important later. The whole earth had one language. By the way, linguistics professors, scholars, they all agree that all languages on earth likely stemmed from one. The whole earth had one language with the same words. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And I want you to notice the wording. The whole earth, one language, the same words. They're all together. This sounds like it's unity. It's wonderful, right? Innocent enough. 
But what you find out in two quick verses here is that their motives for what they're seeking to do are entirely about me. This is my city, and it's my motivation. It's my kingdom. It's for my name and what I want, right? And so their motives are proud and rebellious. They said to themselves, come, let us build for who? Ourselves. A city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And when I, was in, when I was a young kid, and I would occasionally hear a Bible story, I always heard this story like, you know, they were building this tower, right? The Tower of Babel so that they could reach the heavens because they really wanted to be with God. But they were doing it the wrong way. N- no, <laughs> that, that's a horrible, horrible, horrible teaching on what this passage is getting at. Let me help you. A city in the ancient world is a kingdom. Kingdoms come out of cities, Babylon, Rome, Athens. So they're building a city and they want a kingdom. And it says, let us build a tower with its top to the heavens. And so I want to stop for a moment. Why are they building a tower? What what is this tower? So all religions in the ancient world have sacred mountains. So hang with me for a minute. So the Greeks, where do their gods dwell? On Mount Olympus. For Hindus, where does Brahma dwell? On Mount Meru. Shintoism, where does their chief god live? Mount Fuji. Islam, Muhammad gets his oracle, right? On Jabal al-Nur, a mountain. And so when you went to terrains that had no mountains, guess what they did? They built mountains. A tower, when we think of a tower, we think of Rapunzel, like letting down her hair down the side of the tower, right? Right? No, the word there, tower, it's literally a ziggurat. It's like a pyramid. It's this staged pyramid. Why would they build an artificial mountain that's out in the middle of the desert? There's no mountains. And what's significant about a mountain? It's where God comes to speak to men. So one of the kings later on, just scientific, like archaeological nerd out for a moment, one of the kings who's a later king of Babel decides he's going to rebuild a ziggurat that was once there. His name's Nebuchadnezzar. He actually makes this in one of his carvings in a historical record. Let me see the next one. And you can see it. You see the side of the ziggurat that's going up jagged like that? This is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, who's saying, I'm going to rebuild this thing. And what does he do? This is what it looks like. Oh, my goodness. Is he talking about the Tower of Babel? If you back away from it and I highlight what that looks like, this is what this massive stone would have looked like with Nebuchadnezzar looking down over this great temple of Babel. And you notice at the top of it, there's a temple. And this is where the king of Babel or Babylon would go and he would meet with the gods. Why am I telling you all this? More than a thousand years before Nebuchadnezzar, Hammurabi the king of Babel, has a tower. And he issues the first legal code of ancient Babylon. And there you see it. It's called the Code of Hammurabi. It's one of the oldest legal codes in the world. And what do you see? It's Hammurabi who's going up to Shamash, their god, and the god is giving Hammurabi a decree. And he will go outside that tower, that temple, and he will look at all the people and he will say, this is is what the Lord, gods, the gods have said. Now do everything I tell you to do. It's a fraud, right? Why build a tower to reach the heavens? What are they doing? They're not trying to reach God. They're trying to replace God. Get me close enough. I'll build a temple up there. I'll come out and I'll tell everybody, this is what God says, but it's really just the will of Hammurabi. So this is one of the the ethics of the kingdom of man that we hold on to. And as we're going to see, Pentecost will rip all of this apart. You see, the kingdom of man, what our natural instinct is, is we want it to be about our kingdom. We want our desires, our decrees, our laws. And when God comes to us and says something counter, no, 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 no. I'm on the throne. You think to yourself, oh, I can't relate back to those days. But really? Like, who's on the throne of your heart right now? Do you wake up every morning and think, I'm going to do what I'm going to do? 
because I reign in my life? Or do you wake up in the morning and say, what is your desire for me today, O king? You see, back then, they wanted the kingdom. They wanted the throne. We're not much different. We don't build mountains anymore. But when they say, come, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches its tops into the heavens, it's about our kingdom. The very next line in there, listen, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. What's, what's their motive here? My name. My reputation is most important. I want people, when they hear the name of Sam Caston Smith, to... Right? Like, it's about me. It's what you think of me. That's the most important. That's the kingdom ethics of this world. What's the gospel call you to do? My reputation means much less than yours. May your name be praised. But we don't care about our name, right? We're not like them. Then they said, come, let us, now listen to the last part of this. They they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. What are they saying? We don't want to be scattered. We got all this wealth. We got all this power. It's all consolidated. And man, at the beginning of the scriptures, God told us, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And I don't want to do that. That's really uncomfortable. It's going to require me to stretch quite a bit. I'm going to have to give up a lot of what I want out of this life to obey God's command to go to the ends of the earth with his design. You know what? I'd I'd rather not be scattered. So let's build a tower. Let's build a city. Let's make everything really comfortable so that we can dwell here without having to stretch. My kingdom, my name, my will. And the Lord comes into this earth, and when he teaches us how to pray, how does he teach us how to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, not mine. Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. It throws the ethic of Babel on its head. But when the Lord sees that they're doing all of this, they're coming together, but why are they coming together? They're coming together in pride to build me up. And the Lord said, behold, they're all one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Oh my goodness, look at their pride. Come, let us go down And they are confused their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Do you get that this is merciful? Like in in our modern day, we think, oh my goodness, people are together. They're speaking a common language. This is good. Why does God go mess it up? This is a mercy. They're in outright rebellion, spitting in his face, saying, our lives are about us. I don't care about your world, your will, your kingdom, your name. It's all about me. And God doesn't rain down fire and brimstone. He mercifully says, my goodness, if they come together with this kind of attitude and they compile each other's talents, imagine what they will do, how destructive they will become. And in mercy, he scatters them and confuses their language. And we think to ourselves like, man, I I don't get it. Communication is great. When the whole world can come together and talk to each other, that's really wonderful. I remember when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to have a telephone in my bedroom. Why? Remember, like for those of us who were old enough, you had the really long cord. So if you wanted a private conversation, you had to like go and like close the door and a on the cord and like have the private conversation. Most of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) But every time humanity builds a way to bring us together, it's this wonderful blessing, but here's a problem. We are self-absorbed and fallen. And so every time the world invents some way to bring us together, like the telephone, what does man do with it? He corrupts it. Or the radio. 
or the TV. I remember when I was young, stop watching TV, it's rotting their brains. Initially, it's wonderful. Then comes along the internet, and oh, that has made humanity so much better. Social media, you want to know what Tower of Babel is, why God comes down and says, no, that's it. All of humanity coming together, being able to talk to one another with their selfish, ungodly impulses. Do you know what kind of destruction that's going to cause? Scatter them. I'm still waiting for God to strike down social media. It is the same thing. It is wicked to the core, and it brings out the worst, the the my kingdom, the my name, the my will parts of us. It's despicable oftentimes. So Pentecost comes. Oh, what happens at Pentecost? The Lord shows us that when people come together who understand gospel, who come with need, who come with humility, and the Spirit pours into them, oh, that will reverse all the mess. When the day of Pentecost arrived, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all together in one place. That sound familiar? It's taking us back. And Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So remember, Jesus is crucified during Passover. He's resurrected three days later. All of that is just several weeks earlier. And Pentecost comes, and it's a celebration of the giving of the Torah from God, which is going to be important, and the celebration of the summer harvest of wheat, which is going to be important because God is about to bring a great harvest. Pentecost was one of the three festivals that required all Jews from all over the world to come home. You know why they're all over the world? Well, that same guy, Nebuchadnezzar, who sought to rebuild the Tower of Babel, came, tore down Solomon's temple, and sent all the Jews into exile all over the world. And they went there building up synagogues thinking, what in the world has God done to us? And when these feasts would come, they would all come from all over the world back to Jerusalem to celebrate and give thanks to God for the Torah and the harvest all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven, God is coming down again, right? There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. You imagine that, this sound of a massive hurricane. And it filled the house where they were sitting and divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on top of them. And for the longest time, I couldn't figure out what this was. Like, why in the world is fire resting on the disciples? Why is the wind rushing? I know that wind and spirit are kind of treated the same in Scripture a lot of times. But then it dawned on me, like, this is how God most often appears to come to speak to his people. To anoint a prophet to take his words back to his people. And so when Moses comes to Mount Sinai, how is it described? It is described. This great fire comes down and rests on top of Sinai. Trumpets are blasting. The earth is quaking. Everything is pretty terrifying. And Moses goes into that to receive the Torah. What are they celebrating? At Pentecost, the giving of the Torah. And so now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of all the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and there he receives his commission. Or you think of Elijah. We just finished up a series on the kings. When Elijah went to Sinai, what happens? Fire comes to the mountain. Boom! A great hurricane comes to the mountain. The rushing wind, quaking. And then the Lord speaks to his prophet and gives him a commission, doesn't he? So what are we to imagine when there's a mighty rushing wind and fire's not coming down to rest on a mountain anymore, but fire is resting on the head of each disciple of faith? Do you get the gravity of what's going on here? Like imagine Moses, God comes to Moses and says, you are going to be the one guy who takes the Torah, my covenant with all the people, and you take it to them. At Pentecost, do you get what's happening? The wind is coming, but now fire's on every single one of the disciples. Peter, you're my Moses. Andrew, you're my Moses. 
James, you're my Moses. John, you're my Moses. Bartholomew, you're my Moses. Anyone who believes the gospel is now transformed into what? A messenger, a great prophet that is bringing God's new covenant of forgiveness in the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you get the gravity of what's going on here? And that's what they're going to do. These people will take the gospel to the ends of the nations. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. That's kind of important. (laughs) Because by themselves, they'd be a mess. They'd fail. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see, the miracle here involves the actions of the disciples. They're talking. They're preaching, right? They're doing their faithful part. What's the Spirit doing? The Spirit's doing this wild miracle where He takes words that wouldn't have been understandable to those that they're preaching at, and He translates them in midair so that when they reach the ears, they understand them. He's giving them utterances that are in other languages, And they don't even know the other languages. That's the miracle. You see, at Babel, God came down to cause confusion. At Pentecost, when the Spirit moves and people are humbled and they're united in the gospel, what does God do? God comes down again and supernaturally empowers them to be able to speak to the nations the way the nations can understand. That's amazing. That's really amazing. Amazing. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Hear that? At first, Babel, they go to every nation. Now every nation under heaven is coming in. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. It's a reversal of Babel. Those with faith and humility and belief in Jesus and the Spirit indwelling in them now can understand and have relationship. And don't just miss this as just the miracle. When you're humbled and you have the power of the Holy Spirit working in you, all of a sudden you're able to break barriers. You're able to communicate with those that are different than you. That's what the Spirit enables us to do because we come in humility where Babel is all about rebellion and pride. They were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And I want to ask a question. Why didn't God give everybody the ability to understand in Aramaic or Greek or Hebrew? It's another lesson about what the gospel means. If if Peter and the disciples had started preaching and everybody heard in Greek, guess what's going to happen? Humanity and all of our stupidity is going to go Greek, clearly dominant. Everybody should bow down to Greece. What does he do? He lets each nation hear the gospel being preached in his own tongue. Why? Well, for starters, it sends a strong message that the gospel is for who? It's not just Hebrew. It's not just Greek. It's not Aramaic. It belongs to the nations. All of them. This gospel came to you in your language and your language and your language and your language. Dividing wall, destroyed. And God knew (laughs) that like Islam, right? Islam is first given in Arabic. So now you cannot read the Quran legitimately unless it's written in Arabic. The gospel comes and says there's no one culture that owns the gospel. There's no one culture or tribe that owns this hope. It belongs to the nations. Amen? And so then Luke in Acts begins to describe, and he lists all these countries. And when you first hear it, you're like, just say a lot of people. (laughs) You know, like, why are you listing these out? But he says, Parthians and Medes. And Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and the visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And I want you to understand when Luke is writing all these nations, he's painting a mental picture. 
And this is what that mental picture looks like. You want to know where all those people came from? It looks like this. It's an explosion in every direction. The gospel is, they're coming from every nation. And you know what happens that's really fascinating, being the history nerd that I am? Long before the apostles write the four gospels, or two apostles write the gospels, Mark and Luke add on, before the epistles, the gospel's already exploding all over the earth. How does this happen? We know that Claudius is sending edicts that say these Jews that are converting to Christianity are no longer allowed to travel from Palestinian ports to come to Alexandria because it's stirring up riots. The gospel is causing a havoc. Claudius reigns from 41 to 54 AD, two decades after Jesus at most. He sends out all the Jews from Rome. Why? Because Suetonius, the historian, tells us they were instigating riots because of the gospel of Jesus. Claudius sends an edict to the city of Nazareth saying anybody who takes bodies out of tombs will be put to death. It's called the Nazareth inscription. Look it up. It's brilliant. So the emperor of Rome within a couple of decades is saying this whole business with the resurrection and Jews going out and sharing their faith is causing havoc all over my empire and I've got to squash it. And the question then becomes how did that word get to them before the gospels were even penned? And the answer is, those people went home. They saw what happened. They heard of the resurrection. They saw at Passover the crucified Messiah at Pentecost. They see the Spirit move mightily. They see the massive conversion. They go home to their synagogues preaching, we found him. And the church all over the world at all of these synagogues that exist because Nebuchadnezzar tried to stamp out the Jews and sent them all over the world, now the gospel has blown up in his face and the gospel is exploding all over the world. What sovereignty of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Others were mocking them, the ones who are not yet humble. They're, they don't get it. They didn't hear it in their language. And they're saying, oh, they must be drunk. Peter's going to come back and say, no, 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 it's only 9 a.m. Clearly not a college town. But what's awesome is in response to the people saying, what does this mean? Peter gives his most amazing sermon. Seven weeks after he denied the Lord and ran away. A few weeks after he's devastated by Jesus' questions and the restoration. This guy, whew, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, changed man. Radically different. He gets up and he begins to preach these amazing spirit-filled messages promising that the spirit is coming to work wonders, coming to work miracles. He looks at the very people who put Jesus to death that he was running away from and says, you killed the Messiah. But God raised him up. Why? To bring mercy to you. Whoa, this is not the same dude. He is all in. This is some serious agapao, if you remember last week. And so what ethics does he begin to preach? His sermon's long, so I just want to focus on three, right? He's looking at these people surrounding him at Pentecost at the temple courts, and he says, David both died and was buried. The greatest king of Israel died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. God swore an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants, one of David's descendants, would once again reclaim the throne, and he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Jesus. You know what, David, what Peter's saying? David's dead. The greatest king we have is in a tomb. His bones are there to this day. But God promised a better king. Oh, and this one, death can't hold him. This king is living. He is alive, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He's poured this out that you yourselves are now seeing and hearing. Let me translate in light of what happened at Babel. Hammurabi or Nebuchadnezzar gets up on top of the mountain and pretends like they're having conversations with God and comes down and says, this is what the Lord requires of you. And Peter's saying, no, 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 no. Nebuchadnezzar, dead. Hammurabi, dead. They were frauds. They never talked with God. But our king 
is literally the Word of God made flesh. He is right now reigning at the right hand of God in power, sovereign over everything that's going on in your life. And by the way, He doesn't just come out from the peak of the temple and say, do this. He sends His Spirit to dwell in you. You don't need temples anymore. Why? Because He has transformed you into His temple. The Spirit of God, if you believe in Christ, now dwells in you. And the Spirit tells you what God would have you to know. It's about His kingdom. Oh, and it's about His name. What does Peter say? It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's going to happen to my name, your name, in 200 years? (sighs) Forgotten. Sorry. Bind yourself. Hide yourself. Find yourself. Wrapped up in the name of Jesus Christ. He brings everlasting salvation. It is not about my name. It is all about His name. And lastly, we hit His kingdom, His name. What's His will? What is His will for you? Peter goes on. He said to them, repent. There's nobody in here who doesn't need to repent. You are all sinful. You're all rebels. You've all tried to own this kingdom for yourself. You've all tried to make it about your name and your will, right? Repent. Change your ways. Go to him. Apologize. My goodness, he's merciful. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. What is he communicating there? There's some some actions that he's given to the church. Repent. Have you done that? Are you doing that daily? Be baptized. Are you baptized? Be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness. Received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever asked for the gift of the Holy Spirit to move in your life? To give you a heart that just loves Him more and wants to serve Him more and empties you of all the petty addictions and idols of your life. Have you ever asked for the Spirit to take up residency in your heart? And finally, notice what he says. Remember Babel, they're like, we don't want to be scattered. We're comfortable. You notice what Peter says, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Scatter. Take it to the ends of the earth. Get uncomfortable with what this gospel is doing. Bring this kind of hope to those who don't have it in this world. And by the way, Peter doesn't have to then twist their arms. Hey, we've got programs. Like, come, please, please. Like, we'll reward you. Do you want a gift card? Like, when the Spirit's moving, you can't keep them away. Listen to how this chapter ends. This is every pastor's dream. And so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So at Passover, it's like 30. 50 days later, it's 3,000. And Peter goes to work on discipling. Listen to the rest of Acts 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And they all, think about that, all worship came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and they had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together every day, what? They were attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those that were being saved. Do you want that? I would very much like that. That sounds amazing. Ask for it. Ask for the Spirit to move, not just here at Rio, but in you. You know, one of the things that we do as a church, we can't control the Spirit. 
He's sovereign. He determines when to move and in whom to move. But I remember one of my seminary professors used to say, you can't control whether the wind blows, but you can control whether you put your sails up. So we have constructed different values at Rio that are kingdom-minded, that reflect this passage, and I want to walk you through them. They're going to become more and more familiar, right? What's, what's first kingdom value that we emphasize here at Rio? Gather. Join us for worship. Why? Because like them, day by day, they attended the temple together. They came together for worship. They, were, they weren't too busy. They devoted themselves to the fellowship, and awe and worship came upon every soul. So gather is one thing they did. Another thing they did is connect. It's our second value. Join a group, right? That's, that's the idea. And what is that? They were breaking bread in each other's homes. All who believed came together. They were known. Nobody was invisible. They were known by each other. And they shared all of their things in common. We're not even asking you to do that. <laughs> the third value is to grow. Grow in your spiritual disciplines. Do personal worship every day. Why? You look at the early church when the Spirit moved. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings. What what are the apostles' teachings? It's the New Testament. It's the Gospels. It's the epistles. They were devoted together to prayer. And day by day, they were praising God. They were doing personal worship every day. And finally, serve. Gather, connect, grow, serve. Gather, connect, grow, serve. Serve. They sold their possessions to help those in need. They looked out for the poor. They had favor with all the people in the city. Why? Because they were doing good for the city. Whether you believed or not, you had, they had favor. People wanted you to be around. And God was adding to their numbers every day. Think Alpha. Do we care enough to invite I offered $1,000 for every person you got to Alpha, would you invite someone? What if I told you there's a prospect that they would have eternal life? Is that enough? These are the kingdom ethics. Gather, connect, grow, serve. It is about His kingdom. It is about His name. It is about His will. And it's all all entirely dependent upon the presence of the Spirit. Jesus himself in John 6 says this, it is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh, no help at all. And so like Peter, we've got to be emptied to be filled. And if we can pray, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the gift of your spirit, Lord. I wish that you would give me more faithfulness to die to myself and all my petty selfishness and that your spirit would move through me and through us like it did with Peter on this day to grow your kingdom, to overthrow the ugliness of a world that's like Babel, to bring about the beauty of a world where your gospel is just rich, where we're dying to ourselves, where we're lifting up your kingdom and your name and your will and not so obsessed with building petty kingdoms of our own that are going to fade away just like that tower did. Lord, we thank you that right now you, our King, reigns in the ultimate temple at the right hand of God. You have power and dominion over all of our circumstances. Lord, we ask that you would send an overwhelming portion of your Spirit to just fill us, consume us, change us, change our land, change our church, Lord. Bring about the beauty of your gospel and all that it offers here and now for your glory. Amen.